Okay, so we've got our basic figures using this triangle and a circle, but how do we move from that essentially upright situation to, for example, this man here who's leaning over and who's wielding a brush? Here we have a fine figure of a upstanding young man. Yeah, it's me on holiday and it's probably just as well. My face is hidden with a hat and sunglasses. But how do you move from that essential upright stance to the more animated stance that we have here? And in this case, rather than using a triangle, what I'm going to do is to use a simplified form of skeleton. I think all of us in our time have drawn a little stick man like that with a couple of arms and a couple of legs. But what we're actually going to use is something not too far removed from that. We're still going to have the circle for the head and a little bit of a neck. The only difference is that we're going to put in a line here to represent the, uh, the shoulder blades and then we'll just bring the arms down to the point where they would uh, join at the elbow like that and another slight gap where the hands are. Remembering that the pelvic bone, which we're going to represent by another line there, and you can see that we've created a much more realistic looking figure than our stick man, yet we've used exactly the same principle. So let's come back to the, uh, the fine looking model posing in his summer finery, and let's draw his head roughly like that. And that comes down like that, and then we've got that sort of effect with the feet. Right, now let's look at this chap here. We've got the head there, like that, and the neck which comes down there at a slight angle, and then the first part of the backbone comes down to about here, and we mustn't forget his other leg, joint in the knee, and there we have the figure there. You can almost imagining this skeleton pushing a brush, holding the handle of the brush and pushing it along. Or it could easily be a shovel or even possibly using a garden fork or some farm implement. So you can see right away that that one pose can cover a multitude of situations. I've taken four photographs of my wife Pam sitting on a garden chair on a sunny day. Right, now I've put a piece of paper over the photographs and this time instead of using acetate I've used a piece of tracing paper so you can see the skeleton figures very very clearly indeed. Now I know there's no average size of watercolour but from my experience students tend to paint watercolours round about this size. If you want to produce a watercolour landscape with some figures in the landscape to populate and complement the overall scene, then you're going to find that these sort of figures are going to be far too large and far too dominant. So you need the figure to be a whole lot smaller. Now you can see from these four skeleton outlines of different sizes that these two are probably still are rather on the large side for your watercolour landscape. These two are much more likely to be the size that you want. Right, well when we look at this photograph, I suppose now that begs the obvious question. If it's easy enough to trace down these skeleton images to develop your painting from, why don't you just carefully trace around the whole of the outline of the image and then you've got your figure already on your watercolour paper. Now of course the great advantage of putting the skeleton in, apart from simplifying things for you, is that you're able to change the type of clothes that's being worn and even if you wanted to you could change from a female to a male or, or vice versa. All I'm going to do is to keep this as simple as I possibly can. So I'm starting off with some light red for the flesh colour and that's going over the whole of the head there like that. There's some light red going over her arms, don't forget this is a sleeveless dress. It's all in proportion, there's only half an arm showing there because that's going to be hidden by the magazine. Take some of that colour out because when that dries light that'll represent the sun shining on her from the right hand side of the picture. What I hope you can see is that I'm going to leave a little bit of a halo around her shoulders and around the back of her head like that 
and that's a very good way of portraying bright sunlight shining on somebody. You can see the way it's here, particularly it's standing out already. Now I'm just adding a little bit of shadow on the legs and again some shadow on the arms here because that's in shadow. But you can see that without doing anything really difficult, just by using that skeleton figure, we've created a very believable background figure with plenty of light and shade on and some shadows on the floor. Right, I've just added some darker colour in the tree and that helps the whole figure to stand out much more easily. You can see now if we'd have tried to draw any more detail before we'd have started painting, we'd have got ourselves in a mess. So the talk of figures being in the middle and far distance and in the foreground has reminded me of, of an important point I wanted to mention to you. Now I'm often asked how you deal with figures when you've got a whole range of people, some in the foreground like this who are obviously much bigger than the people in the middle distance here and bigger again than people perhaps 200 yards away in the far distance. But generally speaking you can see that as people get further away their heads stay on or around that eye line and you can see the way this works in a photograph and what actually happens is that they get smaller from the feet upwards. Now obviously where you've got children or maybe somebody sitting down somewhere or lying down their head is obviously going to be lower than your eye line but if you assume that my eye line is on the horizon you can see that that's where you place everybody's head as a starting point. Right, let's give my missus some company and paint some more figures.